Sports Center. He's dominated the hockey headlines of late, and now Detroit has come to a decision on Dominic Hasek. Meanwhile, this dunk could be done in Anaheim. It's not Labor Day, but it is an intensive labor for the Thai Cats and the Arcos. We've got a pair up front for the Blue Jays and the Tigers. Mark Filipousis had more than one ace up his sleeve in his match with Andre Agassi. Vancouver puts the finishing touches on its presentation to the IOC. Our plays of the week, very catchy. And so is Sports Center. It's next. Welcome to Sports Center. I'm Darren Detition along with Jay Onright. We are glad you tuned in, folks. We'll get to the Dominic Hasek story in just a second, but first, another huge name in the National Hockey League apparently hitting the open market, though. Yeah, he is hitting the open market. You know, for as long as Paul Correa has played in the National Hockey League, he has been a part of the Anaheim Mighty Ducks. In his first season, they won just 16 games. This spring, the team finally got its ducks in order, and they went all the way to the Stanley Cup final. It was more than Korea or any other member of the organization had experienced. It signaled a change. And so does this. The ducks tonight did not give Korea a qualifying offer, making him an unrestricted free agent. Financially, it didn't give us a chance to do the things that we wanted to do with our hockey team when you have Paul at $10 million. So we, we just felt that we have to restructure and uh, to do that, make an adjustment. And hopefully, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to talk to Paul and bring him back at, at a different level. This has got to be very tough to take for any Ducks fan as Korea was Anaheim's all-time leader in games played, goals, assists, and points. Now, in other hockey news, the Detroit Red Wings have paved the way for Dominic Hasek's return to the Motor City as they have picked up an option that they hold on Hasek's contract. Hasek, of course, played only one season with the Wings. However, it was a very successful one as he helped capture the Stanley Cup. The Red Wings must decide what to do with Curtis Joseph, who is two years remaining on a contract that will pay him $8 million per season, a contract that also includes a no-trade clause. And there's more news out of Motown as the Red Wings have taken their offer of a four-year contract at $10 million per season off the table to restricted free agent Sergei Fedorov, meaning Fedorov will become an unrestricted free agent as of midnight Eastern. However, the Wings continue to negotiate with the 1994 Hart Trophy winner. It was a busy day for the winged wheel. They also re-signed tough guy Adara McCarty to a four-year deal worth $8.75 million. McCarty led the Red Wings with 138 penalty minutes the last season. A more hockey news for you. The Edmonton Oilers have acquired the rights of pending free agent Brian Leach from the New York Rangers in exchange for goaltender the UC Market and a conditional draft pick. Now, if Leach signs with another team after midnight Eastern time, the Oilers will receive compensation from the league in the form of an extra draft pick in 2004. As for the Philadelphia Flyers, defenseman Eric Desjardins remains with the team. He gets a two-year deal worth $4 million a season. Desjardins led the Flyers last year when it came to plus-minus. He was a pretty impressive plus-30. Now, this offseason will be a free agency period to remember because of the labor uncertainty in 2004. There is uncertainty now. Need a big, bruising blue liner who goes by the name of Frank and Hatcher? You could get one. What about a shifty offensive defenseman? You could get that. Or what about a goalie, a goal scorer, a speedster, perennial all-star, or a crippler like Brian Marchmont? They could all be yours, Jay, if the price is right. Yes, and the quarterback position is a slight problem for the Hamilton Tiger Cats right now. Danny McManus, who is almost old enough to be a punter in this league, is nursing an injured hamstring. So that leaves Pete Gonzalez, David Corley, and Toronto cast off Reggie Slack to try to direct the Tabby's offense. And did I say offense because there was none to speak of against the Argos on Monday night. This game marking the return of Joe Munford to Toronto as a member of the Tabbies. Danny Mack on the sidelines pondering what would be a disastrous game. Giving way to Pete Gonzalez. Second quarter, Paul Oswaldison in trouble. Bad snap. Former Tabby Clifford Ivory. 18 yards for the score. 18 up in Argos. Could I possibly get... A reaction shot from Mike Pinball Clements. There we go. Man, he's a happy man. And to Gonzalez we go, and he was struggling. Steps back. Is this rugby? I'm not really sure. And this is ugly as well. Gonzalez looking for a throwing lane. Clifford Ivory found the lane. 
Second TD of the game, 51 yards. The self-destruction continues. Tiger Cats continue to shoot themselves in their cleats. 20-point second quarter for the Tabbies. Here comes Reggie Slack into the game. Reggie Slack sacked by Marvin Thomas. Couldn't get anything done. Gonzalez wanting to get back to the game. Look at the look on the coach's face. Yeah, don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. Just when things couldn't get worse, they do. Bashir Levingston, first game back with the Argos, was great as a rookie last season. Fresh from a trial with the Miami Dolphins. And I would say the Argos are pretty happy to have him back. A 72-yard punt return for a touchdown. 35-1 for the Argos. And just when things couldn't get any weirder. That area, they right? Easy. <laughs> and the lights have gone out at Skydo. And, and you know what? And probably they went out a long time ago. This is a laugher. You see? A laugher if you're an Argos fan. 49 to 8 is your final in this one. And Damon Allen, who didn't have a TD pass in week one, finished 16 of 21 for 174 yards with two TDs. Argo kicker Noel Prefontaine, who returned after being released by the Kansas City Chiefs, completing all four of his field goal attempts. The Tie Cats home against the Eskimos on Saturday, but Tie Cats coach Ron Lancaster didn't know how to start addressing the Tabby's woes. It looks like we've had a training camp, so maybe we need to have a training camp because, I mean, we certainly didn't play. Uh, football, the way uh, CFL teams are supposed to play, it's a little bit embarrassing. We just came out fired up and we was ready to play. And um, you know, by last week we were losing, losing at the last minute. It just was a great feeling, and we wanted to win under our belt before we go out to um, BC. And like I say, look out, man, because we're back. We took advantage of a lot of things, and this football team will be back. Hamilton will be back. We caught him with their starting quarterback down. And that's always a difficult situation. On we go now to a little Major League Baseball. Loser is such a ubiquitous term. It's everywhere, but rarely applied in the right vein. Mike Marath, you see, is a loser. He's not trying to be. Every time he takes to the mound, he has intentions of winning. It's just that he plays for the Tigers. Marath has already lost 12 games this season and is easily on pace to lose 20. Now, the last time a big league pitcher lost 20 games in a single season was 23 years ago when Brian Kingman lost 23 for the Oakland A's. His manager at the time was Billy Martin. He wouldn't pull a pitcher. He'd just throw rye bottles at him. Uh, tonight, it was the Toronto Blue Jays taking on the Tigers in D-Town and making matters worth Marat just getting three runs of support per game. Look sharp early. Shannon Stewart gone fishing. Then in the fourth, Josh Phelps burn with the breaker. The next batter is Mike Bordick. He also goes down swinging at junk. Marat facing Corey Lytle who was getting some good D up the middle in the fourth. Warren Morris hits a rocket. But look at Chris Woodward, grabs it by the tail in the fifth. The D can't do anything about this. A man on A.J. Hinch, bickety bam. It is a big boy blast. It's 2-1 for the Tigers. It's gone. A few batters later, watch Lionel shake off Tom Wilson. No, no, no. I want to come with this. Okay, meet. Morris rips it to right. Andres Torres comes in to score. 3-1 Detroit, 5-1 Tigers in the sixth. Now they're getting some good D as well. Wilson with a pop-up in foul territory. And Carlos Pena tracking it and grabbing it. 5-2 Tigers in the seventh. Two on for Carlos Delgado, but he's swinging at the off-speed stuff to end the threat. And Roth would get the win. The Tigers win only their 19th game of the season. A 6-2 the final after winning seven in a row. Corey Lotto has dropped four his last six. A Yankees win over Baltimore will put them six and a half up on the Blue Jays in the AL East. Toes up 2-1 early. They'd add to it. Davey Cruz. Two-run shot. Just enough his 10th 4-1. Sidney Ponson cruising. Gets Krim Garcia looking and looks kind of upset here. Why watch? There's Garcia. Called time. But the ump let the play go and he just promptly smacks the Ponson offering deep to right. First is a Yankee. It's a two-run shot. It's 4-3 now. Next time Ponson. What was Garcia swinging out there? Let's go to the seventh now. Yanks with two on. Sydney's done. What do you think happens next? Ruben Sierra, three run home run, is sixth of the season. It's 6 4 for the Yankees for Ponson. A frustrating evening for Garcia. A very good evening. Doing it in the field as well. Nice hustle. Getting Brooke Fordyce in second as well. With the force of Garcia, the hero, the Yanks win. They've won a season high eight straight. Out of the Expos and the Mets, New York has lost nine of their last ten, but Steve Traxel no more than three earned runs in his last three starts. Top of two gets a little deep. Brad Wilkerson gets caught in the rundown 
He was caught napping and he's done. Frank Robinson is clearly unimpressed because the out is costly because the next batter is Will Ford Darrell. A one hopper off the wall in center for a double. He'd score on a sack fly, but it's only one nothing for Montreal. Javier Vasquez, just one victory in his last six starts. Trouble in the third, two aboard. Ty Wigington who follows Cordero's lead. Andy Chavez, he's got a beat on it. But not enough hops. He can't catch it. Ground rule double. That makes it two to one. Little Mets girl. Uh, she's ecstatic with it. Uh, Robinson, not so much. Three one in the seven. Traxel cruising. Sits down. Ron Calloway. Then the pinch hitter Jose Macias. That guy's got a big head. They call him Tatanka. Uh, New York Mets win it three to one. The final. Traxel with a victory as he improves to seven and five on the season. Before he won the first of his eight Grand Slam titles at Wimbledon in 1992, Andre Agassi was all hair and no game. Now he's no hair and all game. But at age 33, he's running out of time. And as the top seed left at Wimbledon this year, it looked to be his best chance for his second Wimbledon crown. Standing in his way in the fourth round was hard-serving Mark Philippoussis of Australia. Oh, yes, he's still around, but he's been hampered by injury the last couple of years. You got to watch with the Australian because he is a very powerful server. Though Agassi probably the best server turner in history. Philippus is nine in a lifetime with belting up 40 aces or more. Look at Agassi though, showing the strength. Great return there. Another forehand return. He won the tiebreak 7-4. He added two sets to one lead after three. The scud though, pure power in the fourth. 30th ace up 4-1 now and then is 35th. He took the fourth set 6-3. So we go to fifth and deciding set. Agassi getting the drink, getting the rest. Trying to avoid the upset. Once again, a terrific return winner. But Philippoussis is not all big serves. Watch the touch. Beautiful stuff. The 92 champ needing to dig deep, stay alive, but the scud was firing as we say out west. BBs. 46 aces, tying a Wimbledon record held by Gordon Ivanisevic. On to match point. The unforced error by Agassi, and he is done in a five-set thriller. Afterward, Agassi was asked if the loss was hard to take. You know, the bad news is, is that it's, it is more disappointing because you sort of realize that it's another year lost at Wimbledon. Um, the good news in it is, is that, you know, you get to go home to your family and you get to sort of regroup and you get to get out again and keep, and keep trying and hopefully make something special happen. Still to come on this edition of Sports Center with Decision Day looming in Prague, Vancouver gains some star power. We're going to make an impact. The two of the biggest sluggers in the game hook up in the show me state as the Giants battle the cards. Dead center field on the run as Bradley at the track makes the catch. And we've compiled the best from the past seven days in our plays of the week. You're watching Sports Center. Sports Center, brought to you by Scott's Turf Builder. Picks them up this weekend at your local Canadian Tire Store. Welcome back to the show. You know, two days from now, the city of Vancouver will either be celebrating the fact they will host the 2010 Olympics or lamenting its loss. The final decision will be announced on Wednesday, and by all accounts, the Canadian bid appears to be the favorite. Now, in an effort to try and sway the voters, the Canadian delegation has incorporated the great one, Wayne Gretzky, into their presentation. We just have James Duthie. He is more from Prague. As the great one and some jet-lagged little Gretzkys arrived in Prague, the rest of the Vancouver Whistler team was rehearsing every detail of its presentation, from where they sit to how they clap. Every time we do the presentation, we're better. And it's emotional every time, which to me that just means that, you know what, it's from the heart and we're, we're, we're going to make an impact, so it's great. So Canada has star power with Gretzky and LeMay Doan, and a bid most believe is the best of the three. But this vote may have little to do with who's best and everything to do with the IOC political game. Politics is always a major part. You, you cannot discount it. There are just too many things that happen around the world that are going to uh, affect the way that IOC members think. So here's how the politics might work this time. NBC just paid a fortune for the rights to the 2010 and 2012 games, which pretty much guarantees one of them will be in North America. And a bunch of prominent European cities, London, Paris, Madrid, are bidding for 2012. So the thinking is that most of the European delegates will vote for Vancouver Whistler. 
you also vote uh, in your own self-interest uh, for what you know your uh, aspirations are Olympic-wise. And if you want to get 2012.